Here we are in Matthew, the third chapter, verses 11 to 12. We just read that where John prophesies there's going to be two baptisms. Jesus is going to do two baptisms, one of the Holy Spirit and one of fire. So let's have a word of prayer, and then we'll get into this study. Give you a moment of silence as a believer priest and dwelt by the Holy Spirit. This is the church age. Every believer at the point of salvation is indwelt by the Holy Spirit. Your body becomes the temple of God. And that's a good thing uh, because the Holy Spirit dwells there, John 14, 16, permanently. can never leave you. That's his assignment. But he does great ministry out of you and to you. Uh, we call that spirituality. And the Bible, spiritual book for spiritual people for spiritual living. And so we've been highly equipped by the ministry of the Holy Spirit to study the Word of God, understand it, believe it, and then the power of the Holy Spirit will help us not only understand it, but live it out into the reality of our life. It will give us great boldness and confidence uh, with the Word of God as we relate it to other people as solutions to their life. Now, you can't study the Bible in carnality and evidence of carnality as personal sin. It could be mental attitude sins, sins of the tongue, or overt sins. And if you're aware of any of those, then your responsibility as a priest under this dispensation to confess sin. 1 John 1 9 says, If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And I. I call that classroom etiquette, and it's required of everybody who studies with me. And if you're at home or in another nation from which we are, it's required of you. It's classroom etiquette. It's respect. That's, that's what I require, and it's be respectful. And so your responsibility is to confess any personal sin that you're aware of. And it's not for salvation. It's for sanctification. It's for the ministry of the Holy Spirit to work the word of God in and out of your life. So I'm giving you in a moment, First John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And buddy, that is a lot of grace extended from the propitious work of Christ on the cross to the Christian life. That's a lot. So I give you that moment. Our Heavenly Father, we're thankful tonight for these that have come our way by automobile and by internet. Pray the Holy Spirit would minister the truth of this great prophecy given by John the Baptist at the very beginning of Jesus' ministry, and he laid that out, and this will go through his entire first and second coming. Because in the baptism of the Holy Spirit, this is for the church. Ecclesiology. But in the baptism of the fire, this is eschatology. And uh, that's the end of time. That's the second coming business. So it's just really interesting how John laid this out and how Jesus walked it out. And, of course, the first half, now we're into a, uh, we're waiting for a second half to begin uh, by the rapture and then the return of Christ. We pray tonight, Father, as we look at this subject matter, we would be able to see the history in it and 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 where the history is going, where where all that, what does this mean? Jesus will baptize with the Holy Spirit. It will be, it will be something. And uh, we pray, Father, that we would be able to warn people of it. They need to not go through it. They need to be part of the believer side of this and not the unbeliever side of it. Because the baptism of fire will remove all unbelievers from the earth. And, uh, and it won't be good on their heart part because the fire is unquenchable fire and is connected with Gehenna, which in the English vernacular would be a hell idea. And so we pray for understanding of that tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, uh, 
what is interesting when you study this as a subject matter, Matthew 3, 11 to 12, is repeated per se in Luke 3, 16. But when you go to Mark's account, Mark 1, 8, you don't have the same thing. And when you go to John 133 on this subject, you don't have the same. When you go to Acts 1, 4, and 5 on this subject, you don't have the same thing. When you go to Acts eleven sixteen on this subject, you don't have the same thing. So why don't we pick one of these? Because they all... So let's just, because we just read Matthew, so let's go to my, the next book up is be Mark, so let's just turn over to Mark. Because Mark will tell you the same thing the rest of them do. And I want you to find out what's missing. I left a blank line so that you, if you have a desire to write it there, then you will know when you read these other passages that it won't, that the whole, the whole thing won't be there. So when you read 8, John is speaking here. John is telling the same thing, and this is Mark's account. And uh, he says in verse 8, I baptize you with water, but he, but he, the Messiah, will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Right? So I got Mark 1, 8, John 1, 33, Acts 1, 4, and 5, Acts 11, and 16 on this very subject of Jesus baptizing. Um, only two of the writers on this subject talk about this. So what is missing is the baptism of fire, right? He doesn't mention it, any of them. But Luke, and it's kind of interesting because... Who wrote the book of Acts? Luke. So apparently he's depending on you to have read the first volume of his writings in order, in order to understand the book of Acts. Isn't that interesting? And his great subject in the book of Acts is the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which we study in great detail. Great. And so he's not interested in the subject of the second coming of Christ in the book of Acts, in regard to that idea. Apparently, because Luke and Matthew are right on the same page in their volume on what John said to him. It's just kind of interesting when you look subjects up, right? I mean, this is true, you know, in history. Sometimes you have four, four great historians write on some subject of Roman Empire or something, and they, they all float around some pretty good issues with different views, and uh, doesn't mean they're wrong. This means you got different views, and but we see here. But it makes sense to me to find Luke not mentioned it in Acts, because Acts is all about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It is the key. Well, anyhow, I just, I just say that for your benefit. Uh, we're going to talk about four things today, and then we're going to come back next week and look at the same subject again in more detail. But I want, to, I want to pay attention to what Jesus said about it tonight. Um, there is confusion about Jesus' baptism of fire because of its use symbolically. There are a lot of people make it. They don't pay any attention to verse 12. And listen, you could understand that because if you took Mark's account, John's account, or Acts' account, the baptism of fire wouldn't be in there. You understand? So if you read those, uh, and you said, well, there was fire, and you, you read, for example, uh, Acts 2, you can see how people could get it confused by not looking thoroughly at the subject matter. So I wanted, I wanted to discuss because a lot of people, they take the baptism of fire to be what happened at Pentecost, and that's, that's, not, that's not it at all. That's called Jesus' baptism of the Holy Spirit. That's not called Jesus' baptism of fire, unquenchable fire. <laughs> That's not the same thing. So, uh, so this is what's important. For example, the Holy Spirit was symbolically used 
the whole, the, for example, the Holy Spirit was used symbolically as a dove. A dove is used in Matthew 3.16, and there's a key phrase in there that's really important, and I'm going to highlight it. After being baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were open. This was when Jesus was baptized by John and identified as the Messiah. And the heavens opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending as a dove and lighting on him. Now, what's interesting about, about Hose, see, S-O, see the S-O, the H-O-S-E-I? Pay attention to that for a moment. Let's go to a second example of uh, symbolism. Later, the Holy Spirit was used symbolically as fire in Acts 2, 3. And there appeared to them tongues as Hose of fire distributing in themselves, and they rested upon each of them. Now, this word as, is it tells you that's symbolism. That's not literal, it's symbolism. And I showed you, see, you have a separation of hos and ei, which is a first-class condition. And so it's a very strong uh, illustration or, or, or example. And, and they're used in both of these ideas, okay? Um, what is interesting about the baptism of Je Jesus' baptism of the Holy Spirit and Jesus' baptism of fire is they represent both of his comings. Now, we've said this many times in the Old Testament, they didn't know there was a first and second coming. There was just the coming of the Messiah. The only way there is a first and second coming is for the mystery of the church. The mystery of the church sets in between the first and second coming of Christ, as we well know now. And that's a very big issue. So when, when, you, when you have the ba baptism of Jesus Christ, the, the Jesus baptism of the Holy Spirit, you have the first coming of Christ. And when you have the baptism of fire, you have the second coming of Christ. And that's a very big issue in this. Very big issue. And so we see that in the two, the, the two areas that I just mentioned uh, with Matthew 3.16 and Acts 2.3 in the symbolism and then the fact that we're talking about Jesus' baptism of fire. So don't misstrew the fact that fire is mentioned at Pentecost. Remember that Pentecost is Jesus' baptizing with the Holy Spirit, not with fire. Right? And the fire that's used there is a symbolism just like the dove was, right? And the same technical Greek word is used. That's important. It's a, it's a pretty technical Greek word. It's a compound word. It's kind of technical. Here's the second thing. And, and, and of course, that to me, that, that technical Greek was important in language. Matthew 3.12 in Matthew 3, 12, Jesus' baptism of fire is part of the second coming of Christ. And in this 12th chapter, I mean, in this, 12, in this verse 12, he tells you four things, and you need to separate these things out and look at them. He says that the, the widowing fork, uh, in the Greek language, I mean, if you looked up widowing fork, you, you're all over the place. <laughs> Come on in here. Be sure to pick up a study guide there. Yeah, they'll probably sit back there. Uh, the Whitting Fork, if you looked if you looked up this in the Greek language, it and, and if you have a, a Greek interlinear, it will be called a fan. Now the, a widowing fork is probably a, a good translation of that because it, it is something that was developed for throwing up shaft, a uh, 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 straw in that, and then getting the, the wheat to fall and the shaft to fall out of it and that, that business. As a farm guy, we called it sifting. That's what we called it. Um, you s sifted your grain and things like that. Uh, but that's what that's a reference to. And so for those of you that you know, or in the Greek language. Uh, but what it means is throwing up something in the air and 
and separating them. Right? You've seen you've seen pictures of this, and um, some of you are probably old enough that you probably even saw people actually do it in your life. I mean, I did. Uh, but anyhow, what it is is separates the, and this is important. It was a system for separating the wheat from the shaft. Chaff. Okay. And what you're going to see this means, what you're going to see this means is separating believers from unbelievers. And say, I'm telling you up now, I mean, we're going to see that. Okay. The other thing that is introduced here is a. Uh, Thoroughly cleansing the floor. In other words, what's going to fall, we want to keep. The wind will blow the shaft to some other place, and what we're going to keep is what falls to the ground, right? And so there's, we're going to be sure that we lose nothing because that's where all the grain is, and that's where all the profit, that's where all the, you know what I mean? So that's important. Um, and um, this, this whole concept now is this, this is a concept of separating the believers from the unbelievers and securing all the believers. You understand that? It is securing of all the believers, right? You understand when you throw it up in the air. They, they, okay. no. Then the third thing that's emphasized is the gathering of the wheat into barns. And that shows the security of believers. The security of believers. And that's... That's where the, the product is. That's where the value is. That's what all of this work was about. Agreed? And then the final point of verse 12, the final point, I'm in Matthew 3, 12, the final point is the shaft is burned up with unquenchable fire. Now, I want you to write this on your paper because it shows a connection that's really important. Write down Mark 9.43. Mark 9.43. Because it tells us that the unquenchable fire is connected with Gehenna. And Gehenna is the, is the place where unbelievers go and, and, um, and are kept and then are later going to be put into the lake of fire. All right? So that's an important unquenchable fire uh, is, and that's the divine judgment, divine judgment of unbelievers, okay? So, now, what he did is he laid out something really, really interesting. He said, look for these, right? Look for these four things. Are you, are you with me? Now, Jesus takes these four points. Jesus takes these four points of, of his ministry out that's coming. He's got two coming to... I, in his coming, there's two things going to come. The bab baptism of the Holy Spirit and the baptism of fire. He, he's, he's responsible for both of them. And when he talks about the baptism of fire, he understands he's got four points that has to always be identified. Do you understand that? All right. Now, at point number three, Jesus taught seven parables on this subject in the book of Matthew. Now, this is where Bible study is going to come in to play. So I want us to go to the book of Matthew and notice on your paper, I, I want you to start with 13. These are seven parables on this subject. So go to Matthew 13. Notice on your paper, I'm at point three on, a, on probably the backside or somewhere. Backside. A backside. Um, that's the story of my life right there. Um, 13, let's see if I 13, and uh, this is the parable, a very famous parable between uh, the parable of the wheat and the tares, agreed? Yeah. So here we are in verses 24, he gives the parable uh, in verse 24 through 30. He presented another parable, 13 is loaded with them, but I'm after this one. The kingdom of heaven may be compared. Remember, the kingdom of heaven may be compared. That's, this is a parable. To a man who sows good seed in his field. While men were sleeping, the enemy came, stole the tares, and also among the wheat, and went away. 
But when the wheat sprang up and bore grain, then the tares became evident also. The slaves come to the land over, and they said to him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have tares? And he said to them, An enemy has done this. And the slaves said to him, Do you want, do you want us then to go and gather them up? He said, No. Least while you are gathering the, up the tares, you may uproot the grains with them. We used to call that hoeing. <laughs> and you really, I mean, you, the, probably the most training I ever got was about that uh, as a kid on the farm. But anyhow, uh, allow them both to grow together until the harvest. And in the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, gather, first gather up the tares, Bind them in bundles to burn them up, but gather the wheat into my barn. Now, in this parable, he helps us out because <laughs> he explains it. So be, pay, pay close attention to how he explains the tares in verse 36. Now we're going to verse 36, and he's going to explain a parable. He said, and then he left the multitude and went into the house. His disciples said, explain to us the parable of the tares of the field. He answered and said, the one who sows, now watch this, watch for seven things. And I'm looking for four. Watch for seven things in this parable. He answered, he said, the one who sows the good seed is the son of man. That's Messiah. The field is the world. And as for the good seed, these are the sons of the kingdom. And the tares are the sons of the evil one. That's Satan. The, these are the arch enemies on the earth. And the enemy who sowed them is the devil. See, I got two sowers. Got two seeds. Okay. Now watch this now. And the harvest is the end of the age, not ages now, age. See that? And the reapers are angels. Therefore, just as the tares are gathered up and burned with fire, so shall it be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send forth his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all stumbling blocks and those who have committed lawlessness and will cast them into the furnace of fire. In that place there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears, let him hear. Now, look, we've got the sower of the good seed. That's the Son of Man or Jesus Christ. We have the field. That's the world. We have the good seed. That's the Son, right? Of, that's the, the sons of the kingdom. That's the people that we call born again. We have the tares. They're, they're the unbelievers. In other words, the good seed are the believers. The tares are the unbelievers, right? They're the sons of Satan. They followed his way rather than Christ. Listen, you're going to go one way or the other. There's no neutral. Either you believe in Jesus Christ or, or you follow the way of the devil or you follow the way of the Lord. There is no, there's no neutral except until you make a decision. You either buy in, buy into Christ or you, you don't. And when that decision's made, there you go. All right. The enemy is the devil. He sows the evil seeds. And the harvest is the end of the age. And the harvesters are the elect angels. That's seven things in this parable. Right? And we, we've got the unquenchable fire business in this. We've got everything we're looking for in this for us to understand that he's talking about Jesus baptizing with fire. You understand that? Now, what would be the end of the age? Not ages now. The end of the age would be the millennium. Right? That's the millennium. The end. Yeah, the end of it. Mm -hmm. 
Because now we're going to the great white throne judgment and all that business, right? We're into, see, now we're into Revelation. Right? We're into, look, I, I'll give you two books. When you're talking about Jesus baptizing with the Holy Spirit, that's a book of Acts. When you're talking about Jesus baptizing with fire, you're in the book of Revelation. Now, there, there are teachings that I'm going to show you, there, right? There, here's one that's really, whoa, and he explained it, didn't he? He explained it to him. He said, would you explain it? He said, sure. Now, you know, you, who do you have to explain things like this? You don't have Jesus, right? But you do have, well, you have the Holy Spirit. You have the Holy Spirit. You have the third member of the Godhead, and that's his assignment. Much of the stuff we don't understand the Bible, we've, we've never consulted him about it. We've consulted everybody else in the whole wide world, but the one person can explain it correct. We'll read 10 commentaries. We could have spent, a little, we could have spent 15 minutes with him and had it all done. <laughs> Here's another parable. Go. Repeat the seven. The sower of the good seed, the field, the good seed, the tares, the enemy, the harvest, and the harvesters. Now, if you'll, if you'll just take those seven and go into that text, you can see what he's talking about, okay? That's, all, that's fine. Look, I'm okay with that. The world. The world. The sower of the good seed, the field, the good seeds, the tares. I should have wrote that on my paper, shouldn't I? Uh, the tares, the enemy, the harvest, and the harvesters. Stirs, the harvesters. All right, we're the angel, elect, elect angels. Yeah, okay. And uh, the wheat. What's that? What? What? That? They, they're they're going to be gathered in the barns. Great. And 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 the tares, they're going to be burned. Be burned. Yeah. You understand that? I mean, here, here's one parable on that very subject. Here's a second parable, Matthew 13, 47 uh, through. Um, well, I went through 50. Uh, the kingdom of heaven. The first three I got are going to be introduced as the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven is like a, a dragnet cast into the sea and gathering fish of every kind. When it was filled, they drew it up on the beach and they sat down and they gathered the good fish into containers and bad they threw away. Now, what, who's going to be the good? Believers. Who's going to be the bad fish? Unbelievers. And we've got the kingdom. So we're, we're in the same dynamics of understanding what he explained in the first parable. So it will be at the end of the age. Hello. We there, right? We're there. The angel, angel shall come forth and take out of the wicked from among them the righteous, a separation, and will cast them into the furnace of fire. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Okay. That's, that's, a, that's Gehenna. If you study Gehenna, if you study Gehenna, that's what you will find about it. Okay? And then he says, have you understood all these things? And they said, yeah, um, maybe. <laughs> okay? That's like that. after class, Kurt, you say, does anybody have any questions? And they look at their watch and go like, nope. And they got a thousand. You'll see them on the test. What they didn't get, you'll see at the test time. But right now, I think I'm ready to go home. Uh, I see that same thing. Not, not with you, of course, because you're too wonderful. All right. So uh, we have another kingdom comparison here. We have the good, the bad, and all that. Here's another one, Matthew 22. See, he's, he's teaching a subject that most people don't pay any attention to. Now, in between this subject is great lessons. Don't misunderstand. There are great lessons in here. Listen, he, he, he's, he, he's preaching this other part of the message. Um, 
uh, I'm in Matthew, I'm in Matthew 22. This is just kind of interesting. I'm giving you a few of these. I'm giving, I guess, seven, <laughs> I'm giving you seven parables, but they're not the only ones. But I'm giving you some of the biggies. I'm in Matthew uh, 22, 1 through 14. Jesus answered and spoke to them again in parables. He said, the kingdom of heaven, there we are, uh, can be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son. You've probably heard this sermon a lot. And he sent out his slaves to call those who had been invited to the wedding feast, and they were unwilling to come. Again, he sent out other slaves, saying, Tell those who have been invited, Behold, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen, my fat, and live cat stock, and stock are all butchered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding feast. They paid no attention and went their way, one to his own farm, another to his own business. And the rest, and the rest seized his slaves and mistreated them and killed them. The king was enraged and sent his armies and destroyed those murderers and set their city on fire. And then, then said to his slaves, the wedding is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy. Boy, there's a lot in this one, isn't there? I mean, you can see the fifth cycle of uh, Israel and everything in this one. And when the king came, uh, let's see, and those slaves went out in the streets and gathered, and they found the evil and the good, and the wedding hall was filled with dinner guests. And there's another point, evil and good. And when the king came in to look over the dinner guest, he saw there was a man not dressed in wedding clothes. He said to him, friend, how did you come in here without wedding clothes? And he was speechless. The king said to the servant, bind him hand and foot and cast him to outer darkness. In that place there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called and few are chosen. Okay, there's another parable on this subject matter. That we have the clothed and the unclothed, right? We have the saved and the unsaved business. In Matthew 24, it heats up again in the book of Matthew. Boy, Matthew was really all over this. I mean, this really impacted his life later, didn't it? And he wrote this. Matthew 24, 42 through 51. Don't let me miss anything on this when I'm going through that. Um... 42, let's say start with 42. Uh, therefore, be on the alert. Therefore, be on alert. And, and you just have to know how, how chapter 24, what, what he's talking about in chapter 24, this is a biggie. I mean, we're getting to, we're getting to shutdown time here, Matthew 24. And Matthew 24, he does, he's not just in a bunch, I mean, he is into some heri- very serious, heavy discussion with Israel about what's coming up. And so, so, therefore, be on the alert, for you do not know which day your Lord is coming. But be sure of this, that if the head of the house had known at what time the night uh, of the night the thief was coming, he would have been on the alert and would not have allowed his house to be broken into. For this reason, you be ready to, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour when you do not think he will. Isn't that interesting? I mean, where is their head? They should have got security cameras and things, haven't they? Done it. So then, in the uh, well, so then is the faithful and sensible thy, thy good and faithful servant business is here. Who then is the faithful and sensible slave whom his master puts in charge of his household to give them their food at the proper time? Blessed is that slave whom his master finds so doing when he comes. Here's a truly, truly. Truly, I say to you, but we're in Matthew, so we'll only get one. Truly, I say to you that he will put him in charge of all of his possessions. But if that evil slave says in his heart, my master is not coming for a long time and shall begin to beat his fellow slaves and eat and drink with drunkards, the master of that slave will come in and remember this is a parable now. He's dramatizing a point. And the master of that slave will come on that day when he does not expect him and at that hour when he does not know. And shall cut him in pieces and assign him a place with the hypocrites. Weeping shall be there and the gnashing of teeth. Right? And so he does it once again. We have the sensible, we have the good and faithful servant, and we have the evil servant. Yeah. Matthew 25. Matthew 25, 1 through 13. 
It goes back to the kingdom now. That's really important. Then the kingdom of heaven will be comparable to ten virgins, uh, bridesmaids, who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were prudent. When the foolish took their lamps, they took, they took no oil with them, but the prudent took oil and, and flash along with their lamps. Now, while the bridegroom was delaying, they all got drowsy and began to sleep. But at midnight, there was a shout, Behold the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all who were virgins rose and trimmed their lamps. The foolish said to the prudent, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. The prudent answered, saying, No, there will not be enough for us and you too. Go instead to the dealer and buy some for yourselves. And while they were going away to make their purchase, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the wedding feast, and the door was shut. Let me tell you, when the bridegroom comes, the door is shut. And later the other virgins also came, saying, Lord, Lord, open the door. He answered and said, Truly, there's another truly, Truly I say to you, I do not know you. Be on the alert then, for you do not know the day nor the hour. So we have we have the wise and the foolish, right? And you, and a very clear understanding. He's coming and you don't know. And when he does, the door is shut. That's pretty clear, isn't it? Then in Matthew twenty five thirty one, Matthew twenty five thirty one. Oh, Matthew twenty five fourteen. I'm sorry. Matthew 25, thank you. Matthew 25, 14. For it, is, for it is just like a man about to go on a journey who called his own slaves and entrusted his possession to them. And to the one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, each according to his own ability, and he went away on a journey. Immediately the one who had received the five talents went and traded them with them and gained five more talents. That's it. We're talking about money exchange here. In the same manner, the one who had received the two talents gained two more, but he who, he who received the one a talent went away, dug, dug and put it in the ground and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of the slaves came and to, came to settle the account with them. The one who had received five came up, five, five times, uh, five talents, I came up and brought five more talents, saying, Master, you entrusted five to me. See, I have gained five more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful slave. You are faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. You know, that's a principle. If you follow this principle that he laid out, you will find it all over the Old Testament. Joseph, Daniel, all of these guys. That's a principle you ought to learn in your life. Well, anyhow, the one also who had received the two talents came up and he said, Master, you entrusted me with two. See, I have gained two more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful slave. You were faithful with you. I will put you in charge of many. Enter into the joy of your master. And the one who had received the one talent came up and said, Master, I knew you were a hard man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you, you scattered no seed. And I was afraid and went away and hid my talent in the ground. See, you have what is yours. But his master answered and said to him, You wicked, lazy slave, you knew that I reaped where I did not sow and gathered where I scattered no seed. Then you ought to have put my money in a bank, and, my, uh, and on my arrival I would have received my money with interest. Therefore, take away the, t the talent from him and give it to the one who has the ten. For to everyone who has, more shall be given, and he shall have an abundance. But from the one who does not have, even what he has shall be taken away. Now listen. There's another principle there that's good for your life. And, there, and this is how he sums it. And cast out the worthless slave in the outer darkness. In the last, in, in that place, there shall be reaping a gnashing of teeth. And so again, you have a separation, right? You have a separation. And what's he talking about? He's talking about baptism of fire. How do I know it? Because he want, he told me at the end of it what he was, 
teaching about, right? So that's a code, weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now I'm in Matthew 25 uh, at 31. 31. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, that second coming, then he will sit on his glorious throne. Now we're dealing with nations. And all the nations will be gathered before him. Now we're dealing nationally. And all the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate them one from another, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will put the sheep on the right and the goat on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. And he's talking about people, but he's talking about people geographically. It, it's, it's like the Matthew 28, go therefore into all the, all, all the you know, go into the world, a, into every nation of the world, and, and bring accountability to people. Um, the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. That takes us back to Eternal Life Conference, doesn't it? Whoa. For I am hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. Naked, you clothed me. Sick and you visited me in prison. You came to me. You know what that is? That's missionary work. Listen, you ought to see the need in other people for Christ. That's what he just taught you. When did I see you? I was naked and you clothed me. What? Listen, what, what did they see? They saw... Um, uh, a homeless person. And God touched the heart about that homeless person. And, and Jesus says, and they, and they went and did what they could to help that homeless person, right? Or the person in jail, the person who needed a drink. God touched their heart and said, there's the guy, Right? And how did he identify it in us meeting that need for that person's meeting that need was to bring Christ. And he said, you should have seen Christ in the action of that. You see that? I mean, how many people do you look at and never see, never see the need they have for Christ? And so he talks about this. He says in verse 37, then the righteous will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you? When did we see you thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and fight you in or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in a prison and we came to you? The king will answer and say to them, truly, I say to you, well, there's a, a truly, truly, I say to you, to the extent that you did it, to one of these brothers of mine, even the least of them you did to me. Then he will also say to those on the left, depart from me, accursed ones, into the eternal fire, which has been prepared for the devil and for his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in naked and you clothed me sick and you visited me in prison and you visited me. I never saw you. I just saw a first sick person, right? Help. Well, I just read 40, 44, didn't I? I'm, I'm headed for 46. I put down 31 through 33, but I, I, I drove it straight on through, didn't I? And, and it should have been. Uh-huh. Right. Right. Yeah. Well, see, he carried the subject on. Right. I'm missing something. Well, 
Oh, did I? Did I jump? Did I jump ahead? I thought I read that. Well, anyhow, I want your paper to read verse thirty-one through forty-six. Okay. I don't know why I spaced that. Tell you the truth. Mm -hmm. I don't know why I did that. I guess so. Oh, I I think I I don't know. I don't know. I got I got, for one thing I got my sheep and my goats in the wrong place or something. I don't know. But but anyhow, but here here's my point in all this. All of these parables are dealing with Jesus forecasting that this is this is the baptism of fire that that's going to occur, right? It's going to occur. And um, I mean, you read these parables, and these parables have part of it is very important to us. Um, there are parts of it that are everyday life kind of stuff. But the point of it is that there is going to be a separation between believers and unbelievers. That's the point of all these parables, the separation of believers from unbelievers. And those unbelievers, no matter how they're acting and behaving, this is how this is going to ride out. So that's the point of the parables. The point of the parables is to show there are all kinds of different peoples and separations, but it boils down to believers versus not unbelievers. Believers versus unbelievers. All right. So point number four. When you study the book of Matthew, don't forget whether it's Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. When you're studying these gospel books, remember that the old covenant believers were not aware of a difference between a first coming and a second coming of Christ. You've got to remember that. You've got to remember the people that they were teaching were, were Jewish believers still in the Jewish age and were in a transitional period, are, are, are moving. They're not in one yet, but they're moving towards a transitional period when there's going to be this change come when Jesus baptizes with the Holy Spirit this great transitional period is going to come changes of covenants changes of dispensation divine agencies canonization of the scripture all of this stuff is on its way and and he's dealing with people trying to prepare them for where it's going uh, and we all do that we prepare our people. Uh, the the, the big, next big event on schedule for us is the rapture of the church. And when it comes, then all this stuff's going to kick in. And we'll be sitting in the bleachers, so to speak. But, um, but it won't be for those who are left. They'll be going through some tough things. So, it, 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 you know, when you're looking at the baptism of Jesus, you're looking at the book of Acts so to say, and when you're looking at the subject matter, and when you're looking at the baptism, his baptism of fire, you're looking at the book of Revelation. And most people know that, don't they? I think most people know that. I don't think there's any the separation, but the separation between the two advents of Christ in the world is the, is the mystery of the church. The mystery of the church. Notice at the bottom of your paper, I wrote Ephesians 5.32, the mystery is great, but I am speaking with reference to Christ and the church. The mystery is great. And now he, it looks like in that passage, if you read that whole passage of Ephesians, start with verse 22 and go to the end, it looks like he's talking about marriage. You know, and, 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 he, and he was using a marriage as an illustration to teach a great principle about Christ and the church. Jesus did it all the time with parables. I mean, he did it all the time with parables. Um, but I want you to, I want you to, I want you to look with me. I want to go to Romans. I want you to go to Romans with me and watch this. And, and you can understand how we we don't struggle much with this, I suppose, 
except when we get Old Testament, New Testament, and the Gospels, and we have difficulty understanding what, where, what, where everything goes. But in the early church in the transitional period, I mean, this was a, there was a lot of struggle with this. We'll see a lot of this struggle in the book of James, but I'm in Romans 16, 25. Um, every time I turn a page, I get to uh, 25 um, through 27. Well, I just went to Corinthians 16. 25 through 27. He, he closes his book. He's closing the book. This is his conclusion or his benedict. Now to him who is able to establish you according to my gospel and preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery which has been secret, kept secret for long ages past but now is manifested and by the scriptures of the prophets according to the commandments of the eternal God has been known to all the nations leading to the obedience of faith to the only wise God through Jesus Christ be glory forever. Amen. He talks about, he talks about the coming of Christ and the leaving of Christ and the revelation of, of the mystery which has been kept secret for a long time ago and that's the church and the church's responsibility to the nations of the world but now is manifested the mystery has been kept secret long for long ages but now has been manifested and by the scriptures of the prophets according to the commandment of the eternal god has been made known to all the nations leading to the obedience of faith to the only wise God. I mean, I mean, just think about this. I mean, Christ has gone globally in a heartbeat. I mean, historically, what, ha what has happened since Jesus ascended back to the Father, I mean, nothing like this has ever happened. The globalness. I mean, you take great, Great military people, uh, Alexander the Great, or any of these people. I mean, they they talk about how great conquerors were. They just got a little piece of the of the yeah, a small piece of land, maybe big in their day, but compared to the big globe, I mean, nothing. Listen, Christianity. Listen, before the first centuries, there they had they had stretched the gospel to the uttermost parts of the earth. Of course, we didn't understand we had to cross an ocean, but we got, they got to the, they got to their ends, ends of the earth. And that's amazing to me. I mean, if you just look at the first century, you, you just look at what Christian, if you put, if you put all the different conquerors of the world up there, and then you put Christianity with the gospel without a sword, without a tank, without, without any military hardware, other than the gospel of Jesus Christ. And you, if you was to put that on a map and color it, it'd be, that would be unbelievable what was accomplished in a short period of time. Now, you got to stall down a little bit before they actually, but listen, when you look at the early days by the third century, w w where they had gone and what they were doing, and that short period of time, Phenomenal. And think what we've done and think how phenomenal it is today with electronics as far as getting the word of God. I mean, set, we sit here right here and we don't even pay attention to that camera right there. And 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 in a split second of time, we're we're all over the world in a split second of time at, at an unbelievable cost efficient way to do it. I mean, this is, well, anyhow, um, when you, when you look at 1 Corinthians 15, I've got to quit, but in 1 Corinthians 15, 51, it says that the rapture of the church, because we call it the rapture of the church, is a mystery doctrine, right? 
anything connected with the church is connected to a mystery and the rapture. And a lot of people really struggle with the concept of a rapture, and it's just crazy to me. All you have to do is say to them, well, look, look, it's a mystery doctrine. You're going to have to pay attention to the scriptures of the New Testament to, to wrap it out. You're, and then it, it will serve you well uh, sometime to read this Colossians 1, 24 through um, 27. Uh, and the word mystery, pay attention to the word mystery that's used by Paul about the church and what he says about it. I, I've ran out of time tonight, so I don't. I think you will find it to be significantly important to your personal life is what I think. Well, um, Mr. Hardy, you go back and because I'm sometimes really terrible with numbers. So you go back and you go look at all these things, make sure you get that because a lot of times if the numbers don't jive, that's because I wrote them down. Okay. Mm. Uh, call me today. Yes. Listen, uh, that's a wonderful praise. And, and let me show you how important that Tuesday night prayer group is. I know, you know, I, I hold you here an hour. I, I'll wear you down. And then then we have another 30 minutes of prayer. But I am going to tell you, that 30 minutes of prayer, I get more response. Dave today, um, this afternoon, he was able to get a break. He said my, my, he's been really busy. Uh, upwards basketball is on it. Listen, that, that guy reaches 500 kids through, through upward basketball. 500 kids through upward basketball. Um, but uh, he said, I, you be sure to tell your people how thankful I am for that word of prayer. He said, I'm telling you, I talked to my grandmother this morning. Remember, she had, she fell and broke her hip and went through surgery. She said, she said it was a piece of cake. And he said, she could not, I mean, she's just doing wonderful. They're get, getting her up tomorrow or maybe today. And she's just. He said, it was just, I just couldn't believe it. I was expecting to, hear, she's 95 years old. I'm expecting to hear my grandmother, you know, I'm just 95, and I, not her, uh, and legally blind. And he said, Ron, I, I said to her, well, Grandma, you know, we've been praying for She said, oh, I know, I could, you know, you hear people say, I could even feel the prayer. But he said, please tell your people how thankful I am, that little group of people you got down there on Tuesday night. And he said, I'm so thankful for that, knowing that we have, connections with people that can touch the throne of God's grace and, and get things done. I'm so thankful for that. And so, you know, that's kudos to you. Uh, I mean, I can't thank you enough. I mean, that's, I hear this a lot too, by the way, this, and like Pam does people, people a lot of times respond to you, don't they? They tell you, you've seen it with Mrs. White. We all have, but this is good stuff. Well, um, I've had prayer, haven't I? Yeah. Have I not, I've not had, oh, I had prayer to, I had prayer to get rid of them, uh, or to leave them. <laughs> Got John set back there. I thought, I, I thought I'd encourage John. Father, we're so thankful for these have come our way and the great reports that we've heard tonight, Father, about prayer response. We do know this in our hearts. Sometimes our, we, you know, we don't hear the feedback from it. But when we do, it just gives us more reason to boast about you and your grace, the power of God in, in, in our life that could that could touch the throne of grace. And, and, and I don't know. It's a marvelous thing to be connected with a father. If I knew how it worked, I'd be dangerous. But I just know it works. And, and I'm so thankful for it. I'm so thankful to be a part of that. In Jesus' name, amen.